Thank you, Nancy Leach. She is an NEC professor of software science and engineering at MIT. She's actually heading a group distributed system research. And this is the area in which Nancy made landmark contributions, just to mention a few. Uh, the FLP impossibility, uh, uh, IO automata, mathematical system description. And her recent work is in model, mobile uh, and ad hoc network, and today talks will be actually about this. Nancy has numerous uh, awards, as we just mentioned, that she's a member of National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering. Uh, she is, what I just noticed, 2007 Cruz Prize uh, winner, which is a great, uh, great distinction. Uh, recently, 2012, she received a Senna Award. Nancy, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I ever became a member of the National Academy of Science, though. That would be news to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Ah, National Academy of Arts and Sciences. Okay, thank you, sorry. Oh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Yes. Yeah, I have to start out by apologizing for my voice because I've got, I caught a virus from my husband who's had it for a week. And uh, this is a great day to uh, have laryngitis, but anyway. Um, I'm going to switch the screen from my face. I get control of one screen, so I'm going to switch that to my slides. I guess that's how this is going to work. Um, right. Okay, so I'm, this is the first time I've done this, so I have to see how well I can control the presentation uh, this way, remotely. Okay, so I'm talking about distributed computing theory for wireless networks. Um, Okay, so um, we're interested in dynamic distributed systems. So what, we all know what a distributed system is. It's a collection of components that compute separately and concurrently. They interact and they're solving a common problem. Um, everything uh, nowadays is distributed. Um, most modern systems are also dynamic. You have uh, participating processors or uh, agents or devices that join or leave or fail. Um, they can fail and recover. Uh, they can move. Uh, we're commonly uh, considering mobile systems these days. Um, and many of them use wireless communication. Um, so my premise is that we need a theory to help us understand uh, dynamic distributed systems. So what, what do I mean by a theory? Well, we have to be able to define problems that these systems are supposed to satisfy. Um, we have to describe algorithms and uh, come up with new algorithms, analyze them. Uh, we need to have ways uh, of composing algorithms that actually make uh, sense. Uh, we need to define good abstraction layers so we don't have to worry about everything at once. And of course, we also want lower bounds and impossibility results because not everything Thing is going to be possible in such a badly behaved environment. <clears throat> so the, the theory that we're interested in should span from physical network models all the way up to applications, and in between there's many uh, auxiliary services. And this should all be based on um, a, a math, a common math framework. Okay, but the, the setting that we're looking at, dynamic distributed systems, uh, they're extremely complicated. There, that's complicated. So, um, or there's a reaction to complicated. Oh, I can't hear you, can I? All right. Okay, so how are, how are we supposed to construct a, a theory like this? Okay, so the starting point that we use is traditional distributed computing theory. That says, in my book, I should also have Jennifer's book, a, a picture of a book cover for her, her book and maybe some other books in the field as well. Basically, traditional distributed computing theory uh, deals with algorithms, lower bounds, uh, for problems that you're solving in um, standard distributed systems. And then we have a list of uh, types of problems, communication problems, consensus problems, um, synchronization problems, mutual exclusion, and other resource allocation problems. But these are the common types of problems that are studied in standard distributed computing theory. Um, an important part of distributed computing theory is also a collection of modeling and analysis methods. Uh, just because the, um, the systems are, are pretty hard to understand. 
Um, but most of the traditional work in distributed computing theory involves fixed wired networks or shared memory multiprocessors. Uh, but now we need a theory for dynamic networks and possibly mobile wireless networks. So what's different? Well, there's a lot of new complications. You don't know who the participants are. Uh, you know, the nodes can join and leave and fail and recover. You can have mobility. Um, when you're dealing with wireless networks, there's also complications that have to do with um, uh, local broadcast. So, so at, at the foundation of all of this, you have local broadcast communication. Um, a message can reach many different nodes. Um, the success of message delivery depends on the, on the signal propagation pattern, which depends partly on the distance, but there are other factors as well. And then we have an issue of contention, where you have different senders that can send at the same time, and uh, that leads us to message collisions and loss. So these are all new complications, and it, this is really challenging. So how are we going to manage this complexity? Well, the way we start is by studying many individual problems, um, devising algorithms and improving lower bounds, and then trying to build, combine the solutions to solve harder and harder problems, and define abstraction layers to split up the job of designing and analyzing the algorithms. Okay. So this is just a, a big list of a lot of the problems that people in my group have studied. Um, Starting at the bottom, it, it's a kind of low-level problems of localization, which is just having nodes figure out where they are in a, a wireless network and synchronizing their basic clocks, managing contention of wireless communication. And then you move up to some intermediate services like uh, powerful communication services and building uh, network structures. Uh, computing functions in dynamic networks, and then at the top you have some uh, more application level problems like managing data in dynamic networks and perhaps even coordinating robots um, to carry out various tasks like uh, maintaining connectivity, mapping the environment, forming patterns. So this is funny. I can see you all, but I can't hear you. Okay, so these are a couple of the kinds of abstraction layers that we have also looked at. Virtual node layers, reliable local broadcast, communication layers to try to mask the contention. So what I'm going to do in this talk is just um, go through at a high level uh, six examples from my group's work over the past uh, 10 years or so. Um, especially uh, for dynamic network algorithms, especially wireless uh, network algorithms. Okay, and the examples are going back a few years. Uh, the problem of maintaining atomic memory in dynamic networks. Um, the abstraction layers uh, we call virtual node layers. Then some more recent work on robot motion coordination and computing in dynamic graph networks. And then some uh, work that we've been doing the past few years on dealing with low-level communication issues, like dealing with message collisions and communication uncertainty. All right, so I'll, I'll start right in with the first problem, uh, maintaining atomic memory in uh, dynamic networks. And I'm not going to be citing a whole lot of individual papers in this talk. I'm just, am I still there? It says, yes. Why did it ask me if I'm still there? Um, can you all hear? Yeah, can, yeah, I'm working fine. I'm not quite sure it asked why it asked you, but. But I just said yes, and that would seem to be happy. OK. OK, well, we'll see. All right, so um, <clears throat> the first problem is uh, that of maintaining atomic memory in dynamic networks. And um, this is based on uh, um, one main, well, a couple of papers uh, that involve Seth Gilbert, myself, and Alex Schwarzman. This is a nice little uh, icon that uh, MIT Oh, you can see my cursor. Yeah. So this is a nice little icon that MIT uh, used in its publicity about this. Um, but am I having a, a hard time here with uh, this? The screen is flashing. 
Correct. Yeah, we're getting a flashing screen too. So I don't know if it's the content on that slide or if something's happening to the PowerPoint. So maybe. Um, now I can't hear you. You can't hear me now? Oh, now I can. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's the slide. There's an issue with. Is there an animation on that slide? Yes. That's why it's blinking, I think, maybe. Okay. Well, oh, no, there wasn't an animation on that one. There is on this one. Oh, that's pretty uh, fine now. All right, so atomic memory. Uh, it, so, well, I should go back. So, w the problem is to maintain atomic memory in dynamic networks. So, what do I mean by atomic memory? Well, it's um, a type of memory that looks like centralized shared memory. Uh, participants uh, can access the memory by read and write operations. The operations can be concurrent, but it should look to the uh, the people who invoke the operations, as if each operation is performed at some particular serialization point in its interval. So I uh, believe that in a dynamic network, it can be very convenient to have such a, a nice coherent memory. Um, if you had uh, soldiers in battle or first responders uh, with no uh, cell tower or anything like that to coordinate, <clears throat> might be very a very uh, <clears throat> useful service to have a coherent data service that everybody could read and write and know that you're getting the latest value of the data when you actually read. Okay, so I said that the, it, the operations are supposed to act as if each one is performed at some point in its interval. So here's some examples. Um, Suppose you have an object that starts out with an initial value of zero, and then you can have um, two operations, a read and a write. Um, a read can start, and then it can return a value zero. The write uh, that changes the value of the object to eight can begin sometime in the middle of the read, and then it terminates after uh, the read is over. It's okay for the read to get the uh, result zero, even even though it overlapped with this operation that's doing a write <clears> of <throat> a later value. And the reason is that you could put this, you can position serialization points for these two operations where these stars are, so the read is seen as occurring before the write. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so then uh, the, with the same exact uh, positioning for the beginning and end of these two operations, the read could also return a value of 8. And why is that? Well, because you could equally well position the serialization points in the opposite order. So the serialization point for the write comes before the one for the read, and that means that the read, in essence, comes after the write. Okay? All right. So atomic memory has been very widely studied, and uh, a, a famous paper by Atia Barnoy and Dolev in 95, um, uh, studied this problem, uh, came up with a very nice algorithm. Um, so here I'm generalizing a little bit from what was in their paper because I'm going to allow uh, lots of all processes to read and all processes to write. Um, so the algorithm uh, basically uh, uses read quorums and write quorums of locations. Uh, where every read quorum intersects every write quorum. So this is a kind of standard definition of quorums, quorum systems. So here's an example. Uh, quorums could be just like majorities of the copies, but they could also be smaller sets. For example, if these are all the, the locations, the read quorums could be the rows and the write quorums could be the columns, in which case you have a lot fewer than majority, uh, in each quorum, and yet you still have every read quorum intersecting every write quorum. Okay? I think you'll have to nod, because I can't hear you. If, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so, um, good. So their algorithm replicates the object at all locations, and that's good for making it available and for tolerating failures. To read, you don't need to contact all the copies, just a read quorum, and from that you can take the latest version. And to write, uh, you can write to a write quorum. Now, I'm lying a little bit. It's actually a little more complicated than that. Every version um, that gets written has an associated tag, which is like a timestamp. Now, write first contacts a read quorum to find the largest tag. Then it has to pick a bigger tag for writing the new value. 
the read propagates the latest version that it finds to a write quorum before returning its value. Okay? So with, with the, these additional complications, um, it, now it turns out that the operations can proceed concurrently, they can interleave at a very fine granularity, and still you get atomicity. So no matter, you know, individual reads and writes to individual copies can, can occur uh, in any order, and you're still going to get atomicity overall. Okay, but now what happens if the system is dynamic? So this is where our RAMBO algorithm came in. RAMBO stands for Reconfigurable Atomic Memory for Basic Objects. Um, but we were thinking about soldiers in battle at the time, so we thought it was a pretty good name. Uh, so this is actually based on the static algorithm I just showed you. Um, now, instead of just reading and writing, we can also reconfigure the copies. So uh, we have reads and writes, and now reconfigure operations, and they all proceed concurrently, and they interleave at uh, just a fine level of granularity, just like the reads and writes did in the ABD algorithm. And you always get atomicity, and you get pretty good performance and fault tolerance this way. Okay, so the Rambo algorithm, um, is based on having configurations. Each configuration has some members. That's just some set of locations, not all of them. And it has read quorums and write quorums of those members. Okay, now when an object um, is using a configuration, uh, it, the object gets replicated just at the members' locations of that configuration, not everywhere in the whole network. And reads and writes use quorums of this configuration. So that's just like ABD. It, it handles little changes, little transient changes, just like and tolerates small numbers of failures, just like ABD. But if we want to have larger and more permanent changes, we have to reconfigure. So we reconfigure to a new configuration by migrating copies of the object to members of the new configuration. Okay. So the Rambo algorithm has a separate reconfiguration service that determines the configurations. And how it does that, I won't go into right now, but it basically uses a consensus algorithm like Lambert's Paxos algorithm to uh, choose each successive configuration. So then the main algorithm handles the reads and writes, basically running the ABD algorithm, but using all the currently active configurations. So that means if you're changing over from one configuration to another, both the old one and the new one are going to be considered. They're both active, and so the reads and writes will use both of them. Okay, and then the garbage collection of old configurations can happen in the background. So just as a, a quick couple of slides, reads and writes have uh, two phases. The first phase collects information from read quorums of all the active configurations, not just one configuration. And phase two propagates this information to write quorums of the active configurations. Now, if a new configuration suddenly appears in the middle of one of these uh, phases, then the phase can just continue, but now it has to adopt the new configuration as well. So it just adds in the new configuration. Okay? And then this is the, um, the last slide. It says just a little idea about how the garbage collection works. Again, it's a two-phase operation. Um, the, the first phase looks at all the old configurations tells a right quorum of the old configuration about the new ones, like a forward pointer, and it collects object information from a read quorum of the old configuration. And in phase two, you just propagate the latest object information to a right quorum of the new configuration. Okay, so again, you have two phases, but now you have to do two things in the first phase, and they involve all the old configurations. And the second phase, you're, you have to get the new information to the new configuration. Okay, so this gets a little bit complicated. You know, we, we work this out and there's, there's formal proofs for all of this. It's a nice algorithm, but a little complicated. So our, the next sort of direction that we followed in our work was to, to try to simplify matters by using some abstraction layers. The first one we came up with, and this is work with Jennifer Welch and uh, some other people, uh, was a virtual node abstraction layer. So here's virtual nodes. Now this is a list of, uh, we have a lot of papers in, in this uh, topic, in, including um, three PhD theses, 
uh, and many and, and a couple of master's theses. So we had a whole collection of papers. So I'm just going to list all the authors once. Okay. Um, all right, so the idea is to simplify programming for an ad hoc uh, mobile network where um, every, everybody's moving around, uh, and, but you want to simplify programming by overlaying it with a static network. So you have a static virtual network that has communicating virtual nodes. And we're going to write algorithms and applications in terms of the virtual nodes. So we don't actually have the virtual nodes, so instead, we're going to have mobile nodes emulating the virtual nodes. Every virtual node is going to be emulated by nodes in the nearby uh, vicinity. And to do this, we, there are various strategies we can use, like full replication or leader-based uh, strategies. So here's a picture. is a very chaotic-looking mobile ad hoc network. The nodes are going every which way. Now we can pretend that we have these virtual nodes, which the mobile nodes are emulating. Okay, so with that kind of a, a strategy, we revisited the problem of uh, reconfigurable atomic memory. And uh, the solution we came up with was this, uh, geo this algorithm we call geoquorums. So basically now uh, we'll store the object replicas, not at individual mobile nodes, but at virtual nodes. And then we access the objects using plain old static uh, ABD algorithm. But now it uses quorums of virtual nodes instead of quorums of real nodes. So, well, you might notice that the virtual nodes could fail because their regions could become empty. When there's nobody there to emulate them, they're gone. Um, but we have, we're, we're using quorums of virtual nodes, so that allows the algorithm to tolerate the failure of some virtual nodes. And also the virtual nodes can recover when their regions become uh, repopulated and the protocol needs to be able to reintegrate the virtual node into the, uh, the standard, uh, in, into the protocol. So it's a little different from standard ABD. Okay. So now for reconfiguration, we don't need uh, the virtual nodes to reconfigure anymore. Um, the reconfiguration all happens under the covers. We have the mobile nodes that emulate a virtual node reconfiguring automatically as part of the emulation. As they come and go, it, um, the set of nodes that it, are emulating a virtual node changes. And that's handled at the lower lo level. OK, so what can you do with this? Well, you have uh, a wireless mobile network with virtual nodes uh, implemented on top. You can use that to do geographical uh, message routing. You want to route a message to a designated geographical region. Well, it can be pretty hard to just pass it on from one uh, node to another. You don't know who to pass it to. But you could do this by passing it just from one virtual node to another until you get to the right region. Uh, you can do data collection in a sensor network, collecting and distributing data just using the virtual nodes. You can do uh, coordination. So we've got several papers that uh, coordinate activities of nearby nodes. They can be robots or vehicles or even people. Um, so you have a virtual node that takes charge of coordinating the activities of the, um, the participants in its vicinity. OK, so here's an example for, of robot motion coordination. Suppose you, everybody knows a curve in the plane and um, there's some robots uh, that you want to move the robots so that they're all on the curve, or almost all on the curve, and you want them to be evenly spaced around the curve. So this could be, for instance, if there's a hazardous waste area, you might want to arrange the robots around the perimeter. OK, well, the virtual node approach would uh, allow each virtual node to coordinate the robots in its own region. So what does it do? It just sees, it talks to the robots in its region, directs them toward the curve, and spaces them on the curve. And then it communicates with the nearby virtual nodes, sending any extra robots to the neighboring regions. So this is a way of balancing out the robots that you have in the different regions. But in this case, it's convenient to keep at least one robot in the region, even if you don't have any part of the curve in that region, just so that you can emulate the virtual, it, it is needed to emulate the virtual node. Okay? Make sense? Okay, so here's a, a, an example people usually like. So a virtual traffic light. 
So suppose you have an intersection, this happens to me every day driving home, uh, there's an intersection without a real traffic light, and then the cars all come up to the intersection, everybody's so polite that you, you never get through the intersection. So basically, now we have computers in all the cars, we could program the computers to emulate a virtual node. And then the virtual node could be programmed separately to follow whatever uh, traffic light policy we want. And so the output of this would just be in the cars. They would just see red or green on their local displays. And you could have this work like any kind of traffic light you, you would like. Okay. So you might point out that a virtual traffic light would die if there aren't any cars, but of course that's okay because we don't need cars. And we don't need a traffic light when there aren't any cars. Something just popped up on my screen. I don't know if somebody got disconnected or a new person joined. I'm not used to this technology yet. Yeah, sorry, I think Wojtek uh, turned off his camera, so we're still oh. good to go. Yeah, we're still here. You're still there, okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, taking this traffic light idea to the to an absurd conclusion, you can design virtual air traffic controllers. So, th these are um, you can have aircraft in regions of airspace that don't have any air traffic controllers, like over the ocean. So, how would you control access to these regions? Well, there you'd have uh, virtual air traffic controllers, virtual nodes that are programmed to be air traffic controllers. And so they can easily be emulated by the nice, reliable computers on the aircraft. Um, the virtual air traffic controller can be programmed to act just like a rudimentary human air traffic controller. We keep track of the aircraft in the region, tell the neighboring air traffic controllers when they can hand off an aircraft, and tell the local aircraft how they can move within the local region. Okay, so this is uh, the last remark is just that. Well, you, this is compatible with real air, air traffic controllers in some places. They're kind of the same. Okay. okay, so you can use virtual node layers for all of these purposes. Um, so this actually got us into considering problems of robot motion coordination and vehicle coordination. So we, we did quite a bit of work on that for a while. So I'll, I'll describe something about our work in that area. So our robot motion coordination work was uh, headed mainly by Alex Cornejo, uh, who just finished his PhD a few months ago, um, and he's now working uh, at Harvard in um, the RoboBees and Radhika Nagpal's um, robotics group. Um, and here are the other people who are involved in this, various robotics researchers and theoretical researchers. Okay, so now the problem is you have a, a collection of robots, uh, call that a robot swarm. Many purposes for that can be used for exploring an unknown terrain, uh, for search and rescue missions. Um, so, but basically one problem is that the robots should maintain a communication network. Uh, they should be able to determine properties of the environment, and they should be able to coordinate their activities to solve these various problems. So what Alex uh, did in his thesis was actually develop a collection of robot swarm algorithms, uh, but all based on uh, some nice uh, theories. So he has some very nice uh, algorithms and theoretical results along the way. Okay, so some of the problems that we studied were uh, just how do the swarms remain connected so that they could uh, communicate uh, in a multi-hop network of robots? Uh, how do you get the robots flocking, which means they will travel in the same direction at the same speeds and remain connected for communication? Um, and how do they map an unknown environment? How do they figure out where they are um, with, with certain information? Uh, what I'll mention uh, today is just the, the problem of keeping the swarms connected. Okay, so where, where we started with that is that um, any kind of algorithm for a robot swarm is going to be easier if the swarm remains connected for communication. Um, and th there was a literature on robot swarm algorithms that basically assumed that the uh, robots remain connected, but of course that's sort of circular because if you're telling the robots where to go, how can you assume that they're going to do anything? You have to guarantee that they remain connected. So our approach was to define a separate connectivity service for the robots that you can combine with different kinds of motion planners. Uh, the connectivity service guarantees to maintain connectivity 
but it allows the robots to follow their motion plans. But it doesn't always allow them to exactly follow the motion plans because maybe the motion plans are inconsistent with maintaining connectivity. But they do a good approximation of, uh, they, they do the best possible in maintaining connectivity. So now you can use this as a lower layer in designing swarm algorithms. Okay, so we define the service and we developed an algorithm to implement this service. Okay, so I'll say a little bit about how this went. Um, so the communication, we, we developed a communication graph uh, for the robots based on distance. We assumed that there was an edge between robots that are at most a certain distance d apart. So d could be conservative, I mean, maybe uh, robots at greater distances could communicate, but we wanted to choose a number d so that we know that robots at distance d could communicate. Okay, at every round, a robot's motion planner proposes where it wants to go. Uh, the connectivity service then modifies its plans, tells it it can go there or no, you have to um, modify it a little bit in order to preserve connectivity. Okay, so how does this work? Well, at every round, every robot determines uh, first which of its edges are critical to preserve. It could just happen to be close to a lot of other robots, maybe it's not necessary that it stays close to all of them, but it determines which edges are critical for maintaining global connectivity. And then the connectivity service guarantees that the motion in that round preserves the critical edges. Okay, so the main question is, what are the critical edges and how do you determine them? You want to have enough edges so that you get global connectivity but you don't want uh, too many edges, you don't want to maintain too many uh, connections between the robots because that doesn't give them enough freedom of motion. Well, there's, there's a previous literature on that, so here's some different uh, conditions that have been considered. Um, there's different types of graphs that uh, people define called Gabriel graphs, relative neighbor graphs. There's some work by Lee and Wattenhofer and others on uh, just guaranteeing that uh, certain cones, um, which are basically uh, little pie slices from where you are, uh, have to be uh, populated by uh, nearby neighbors. And then there's approaches based on local minimum spanning trees that uh, we developed. Uh, so we use local minimum spanning tree edges. Now, it happens that the it's not too hard to show that the union of local minimum spanning trees, that is if each node looks at its neighbors and gets a minimum spanning tree for just its neighbors, um, the union of all those local minimum spanning trees has to contain the global minimum spanning tree. So it's going to be connected. Now the thing that Alex observed is that all of the other geometric conditions in the previous papers produce sets of edges that happen to include the LMST edges. So you can show in this way that local minimum spanning tree is provably as good as any other choice. So this is uh, the best you can do with uh, local algorithms. Okay, an application of, of this connectivity strategy is uh, a flocking algorithm. So here's an algorithm. At, at each round, each uh, robot is going to start with a vector that it would like to follow, its ideal travel vector. Then it uses the connectivity service to, to modify the vector, and it travels by the modified vector. But then it averages its ideal vector with its neighbor's ideal vectors to get its ideal vector for the next round. Okay, so it, where it wants to go is, is modified by means of averaging with where uh, its neighbors want to go. So it turns out that this procedure converges so that all the robots end up with the same travel vector in the limit. And moreover, the swarm remains connected, so you get exactly what we defined, what's defined as flocking behavior in this way. Okay, so this is actually based on using some uh, uh, previous results from the control theory community uh, by uh, Bert Sekas, I believe, and Sitsiklis. Okay, so we got an efficient and local distributed algorithm to maintain swarm connectivity. And this can extend to stronger forms of connectivity, K connectivity, instead of just ordinary basic connectivity. So the next thing we did is we focused more on uh, what happens in connected networks. 
So this is work that uh, Rotem Ashman uh, did for her PhD thesis. She worked for several years under the uh, CSOI uh, initiative. Um, so what her, her work involved was studying exactly what can be computed in dynamic graph networks, uh, assuming that the network remains connected. So I'll say something about that next. Okay, so uh, she, she wrote a lot of papers uh, in this area, and um, a lot of it appears in her PhD thesis. Uh, I'll just talk about one paper. Um, okay. So a dynamic graph uh, network is uh, it's basically a graph that cha can change at every round. There's a fixed set of, ed of vertices but the edges at every round can change. So you have a fixed set V of graph nodes, and then you have uh, a set E of R for round R for the edges um, at round R. Um, the only thing is that at every round, the graph has to be connected. Um, OK, we have processes associated with the nodes. We assume that they are uniquely identified. And the processes um, in some of the problems that we consider, they know the number of nodes, others they don't. Um, the basic operation is that every round, every node sends a message, and that's reliably received by all of its neighbors at that round. You don't have time to get feedback from the neighbors about what they received. You just can send a message, and then the round's over, and the graph can change. So all right, it's a pretty weak model. Uh, question is what problems are solvable in the model and what does it cost in terms of time and communication. So this is a list of problems that we studied. Um, problems of uh, global broadcast, minimum, counting, consensus, clock synchronization. So I'll just mention um, the global, bro I'll just uh, talk about a couple of these. So this is the simplest one. The global broadcast problem has uh, one node starting with a message. And the message is supposed to eventually get everywhere. Now, uh, the algorithm is very simple. Any node that has the message transmits it at every round. There's only one thing to transmit in this protocol, so there's not much harm for each node uh, transmitting the message at every round. You might as well do that because they really don't know uh, who they're connected to at each round. So, you know, it might be useful for to keep sending it. Um, maybe slightly surprising theorem is that the algorithm solves global broadcast in connected uh, dynamic networks, and in fact, everybody gets the message within just n minus one rounds. So the reason this works is that uh, there's a key claim that says that every round some new node is going to get the message. Uh, why? Well, um, consider any round. Uh, look at the nodes that receive the message already. That's the set A of nodes. And then, since the graph is connected, the edges must include some edge between a node in A and a node that's not in A. So there has to be an edge between someone who has the message and someone who doesn't. OK, so then the node that has the message transmits at this round, and the other node receives the message and didn't have the message before. That makes sense? Just to, uh, to see this as a picture, uh, this is uh, set A. Uh, these are the nodes on the left that have the message. And then um, this is, these are the nodes that don't have the message. There's got to be an edge. If the graph is connected, there has to be an edge that spans between those two sets. So somebody new is going to get the message. Okay. All right, and I'm not going to go through this, but uh, it's very similar. If you're computing the minimum instead of sending a message everywhere, uh, same thing. Now, um, everybody's supposed to determine the minimum input. The algorithm is just that each node keeps transmitting the minimum value that it has seen at every round. But now uh, the, the problem is, when can you terminate? So here, uh, you don't really know when you've gotten everything that you're ever going to get. So um, here you can use an upper bound. If you have an upper bound on how many nodes um, <clears throat> there are in the network, you know that you can stop after um, a number of rounds. It corresponds to that number of nodes. 
So the reason this works is very similar to the reason that, um, that the global broadcast algorithm works. Okay? So a harder problem here uh, is just what if you don't know the number of nodes? And your problem now is actually counting the total number of nodes in the network. The problem is for every node to output the exact number of nodes. Okay, how would you do that? Well, if you're allowed to send larger and larger messages, arbitrarily large messages, it's very easy because a node could just keep sending all of the IDs that it's ever heard. And then, um, well, you could terminate if the number of rounds ever exceeds the number of known identifiers that turns out to work, and you could output the number of identifiers. Okay, but uh, that's kind of a dumb algorithm because the communication complexity is so high. Uh, the problem is much harder if the messages are small. Um, so let's suppose that you have a restriction that, that a node can send only one identifier at each round. So what is a node supposed to do? They, they, um, how do they choose which identifier to send when they don't know who they're connected to? They don't know who's going to receive the message. They don't know what IDs those nodes already have. So this seems like a pretty hard problem. It's not even clear that you can do this at any reasonable cost. But it turns out that you can do it in order n squared uh, rounds. I'm not going to be able to show you details, but I'll give you the flavor of it. Um, OK, so it uses a verification subprotocol that just checks whether your guess is big enough for the number of nodes in the network. So you're checking whether uh, some num arbitrary number k is greater than or equal to the actual number of nodes. And so that you can do that in order k squared rounds. And then once you can do that, then you can do this uh, with sort of a um, successive doubling approach till you find uh, the actual uh, number of nodes. OK, how do you do the case size verification? Well, this gets into a little bit of a complicated protocol. It uses a subroutine that we call k committee, where nodes form committees of size at most k. Um, but there's one thing. If k is correct, if it's at least n, then you only get one committee. All the nodes are in the same committee. So again, no matter what k is, you always guarantee that all the committees are no bigger than size k. But if k is big enough, then you get a committee that consists of all the nodes. OK. So this is just a very brief uh, flavor of K, uh, the K committee uh, protocol. There's a leader election phase. It elects one or more leaders. But when you're right, when your guess is right, there's only one leader. The leader starts a committee and starts uh, inviting other nodes to join the committee. And after K minus 1 phases, um, it's uh, recruited enough nodes to join the committee, and so that, that solves the k-committee problem. The protocol actually, in its details, is a lot like the ones that I showed you for uh, global broadcast and min. Okay. All right, so we can solve, uh, so that just gave you a little flavor of how this one problem is solved, or, and a couple of easy ones. Uh, we can solve many basic problems in connected dynamic networks, and you can also weaken the connectivity requirement Maybe they're not connected at every round, but just every now and then. So you can still solve problems, but it just takes longer. You can strengthen the connectivity requirement um, by saying that you have that nodes can remain connected over several rounds, and then you get better time bounds. But um, basically, there's a lot of interesting results in terms of what you can compute in these, these sort of dynamic graphs. OK. So, all right, everything that I talked about so far assumes communication models with reliable local broadcast. But now we hit the problem that we've been working on recently, that real wireless communication isn't that reliable. Uh, it's subject to collisions, which cause loss of message, messages. So now um, we turn to considering uh, message collisions. So here's some of the people who've worked the past few years on uh, problems of dealing with uh, message collisions. OK, the message collision model says, OK, now you have your computation going in synchronous rounds. At every round, uh, some nodes are transmitting and the others are listening. A transmitter uh, 
doesn't hear anything. It just hears what it's sending. But a listener uh, is going to hear something. Uh, it depends on its neighbors. In the communication graph, it hears silence if none of its neighbors transmits. It gets a, a message if exactly one of its neighbors transmits. And it hears a collision if two or more neighbors transmit. So it either hears nothing or it gets a message or it hears collision, just a garbled message. Okay, so um, let's look at the, um, the problem of reliable local broadcast in this model. This was considered for many years by other people. Not, we didn't start this. Um, so suppose you have a, a static now, a static graph G, and you have a problem where some nodes uh, start out with messages to send, and you want all the neighbors of um, a sending node to... Oh, actually, I said something wrong. Uh, this is a problem of reliable local broadcast. The problem that's been most studied over the years has been a global broadcast problem. So let me reset on this one. So we're considering a problem of reliable local broadcast. And here's a simplified version of it, which is just basically a one-shot uh, problem. You have some nodes in the graph starting out with some messages to send. Um, all the neighbors of the senders are supposed to receive the, the sender's messages. And that shouldn't take too long. But from the point of view of the receiver, you want to do better. Every receiver who has an, any sending neighbor should get some message very quickly. Okay. So the algorithm, um, it's not ours. This is uh, Baryuta, Goldrack, and Itai. It's a very famous paper from uh, 1987. Um, so it works in phases. Uh, each phase has log of the number of neighbors, log of the degree of the graph, uh, time slots. And basically, in every phase of the algorithm, each sending node is transmitting with successively decreasing probabilities. It's exponentially decreasing. You transmit with probability 1, 1 half, 1 quarter, etc., down to 1 over the degree. Now, this turns out to be very nice. It guarantees with very high probability that any particular node that has a sending neighbor gets a message within just a constant number of phases, which is just order log delta time. So it's very quick for each um, receiver to receive something. So in spite of all the conflicts, if everybody is sending according to this exponentially decreasing probability discipline, all the receivers, everybody is going to receive something um, very quickly. Um, okay. Um, and then all receivers get all messages within order delta log n phases, because you have to apply this for to all the receivers and all the messages. So why does the decay algorithm work? Well, the way to see this is you look at it from the point of view of any receiving node, any node U. Um, in every phase, there's going, so its neighbors are all transmitting with these varying probabilities. In any phase, there's going to be some round that's, that where they're using the right probability. There'll be some round that hits uh, U's sweet spot where the sum of the transmission probabilities of U's neighbors is around a one. And when that happens, uh, with constant probability in that round, you get exactly one of you's neighbors transmitting. And moreover, you isn't transmitting. So that will allow you to receive a message. So here you can boost the probability by using many phases. So this is a pretty clever algorithm. And it's used all over the place in this, uh, in this theoretical area. OK, now global broadcast, which I mentioned before. This uses the decay protocol as a, sort of a subroutine. So the problem is one node starts out with a message. It's this green node here. And the message is supposed to arrive everywhere. So here's a very simple algorithm that is derived from the same paper by Baryuta et al. When every node first receives the message, 
it transmits it using that same decay protocol. It doesn't do it forever, it just does it for some calculated number of phases that are enough, and then it halts. Okay? So basically, anybody just waits till they get the message, and then they use decay to retransmit it. So it's very nice. A claim is, says that with high probability, the message is delivered everywhere within um, order of uh, d plus log n phases, where d is the graph diameter. This is very fast. It's just the d is just like the number of hops through the network, and log n is just the log of the total number of nodes. Why is it so fast? It's fast because the decay subroutine ensures that every receiver gets some message quickly when any neighbor is sending, and it doesn't matter who you get the message from. It's equally good to get this message from anybody. Okay. So this is just a depiction. Um, if you look at, um, let's say, this receiver J, how long is it going to take to, for it to get the message? Well, you look at some shortest path from the originator of the message to J, and you see that the message is going to progress one hop along this path of, within a small small number of decay phases with very high probability. So using decay, it gets there very quickly, and then there, and then there, okay, with high probability. And it doesn't matter that there's conflicts uh, as long as some neighbor, is, you, you hear from some neighbor quickly, okay? Okay, well, all right, so we'd like to solve other problems besides just global broadcast. Um, and we're interested in problems of uh, managing data and coordinating robots and setting up network structures like spanning trees, com computing functions, all the things that I've mentioned already. But now we want to solve them in these networks that have collisions. So if you think about that uh, for a minute, it means that you have to deal with some high-level algorithmic issues that could be complicated. At the same time, you have to cope with the collisions. So that's too complicated. Okay, so we're back to, oh my god, what are we going to do? Okay, so our solution to this, we've developed over the past couple of years, is to define another abstraction layer, to mask the contention within a reliable local broadcast abstraction layer. Use that first problem of local broadcast as an abstraction layer. So now you don't have uh, contention to worry about. You just have reliable local broadcast. Okay, so this separates the issues of contention management from high-level algorithmic issues. Okay, so uh, just briefly, we defined a reliable local broadcast service, a, a problem. You can broadcast to it. You get messages get delivered. The sender also should get an acknowledgement of some kind back from the service so it knows when it can send the next message. Okay. And you get some gar delivery guarantees. So our abstract, reliable local broadcast service captures the behavior that you get from this decay protocol. You get reliable delivery of the message to all the neighbors. You get the ACK. You get um, a not too bad bound on the time until you, the acknowledgment happens, meaning all your neighbors have received your message. And you get a very small bound, which we call the progress bound, time for a node to receive some message, make some progress, when at least one neighbor is sending. Okay? Right, so maybe I should let you stare at that for a second. So this is basically implemented by the decay protocol, but now we can hide the work of the decay protocol. So how do we, what can we do with this? Well, we can use this kind of a layer to implement um, higher level, to solve higher level problems and we don't have to worry about the contention. But then separately, we have to design algorithms to implement the reliable local broadcast layer over the real messy collision-prone networks. When you do that, then you can combine the algorithms at the two levels to get high-level algorithms that um, work over collision-prone network models. So you're basically dividing up the work which um, goes some way to reducing the complexity. Okay, so here's uh, some, now I'm just flashing some uh, names of papers. Uh, to implement reliable local broadcast layers, you can use decay and similar uh, style um, probabilistic transmission algorithms. 
Um, or, as a completely different strategy, you can use algorithms that are based on network coding techniques. So this is work with Muriel Medard, who works in coding theory at MIT. And um, so you get alternative forms with, with coding, network coding, when uh, messages collide, you don't necessarily lose all the information. You can decode some, uh, some of the collisions. So if you get enough collisions involving the same, um, the same messages, they essentially act like um, equations. If you have enough equations, you can solve them for the original um, messages that were sent. And here's some uh, problems that we've worked on solving over reliable local broadcast layers. Problem of neighbor discovery, Jennifer was involved in that, um, and leader election, etc. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is an example of uh, uh, this is revisiting the global broadcast problem. So I mentioned that global broadcast is easy using the decay uh, protocol. Um, but, I mean, you have to handle the decay together with the, local with the global broadcast algorithm. But you can write the global broadcast algorithm so that it assumes reliable local broadcast, then it turns out to be very, very easy to analyze. And then you can compose it with um, reliable local broadcast implementations based on decay or network coding, for example. And you get the same kind of results that um, Baryuda at, at all got originally, but you can handle the two uh, kinds of algorithms separately. Okay? And we generalize this to not just broadcasting one message, but any number of messages. Okay, so now I think I'm uh, kind of running out of time, so I'm probably not going to go through the last example, except maybe just sort of flashing through it quickly. Um, so the point here is that we can mask message collisions inside the reliable local broadcast layer and then use that as an abstraction layer to get higher level algorithms. But uh, there's at least one thing that this work doesn't consider. Uh, we have message collisions, but there's no uncertainty uh, in where the messages reach. And this is sort of an anomaly of a, a large body of theoretical work. In the, on the radio broadcast model, where they basically assume messages reach to exactly a certain um, set of neighbors and they never reach anyone else. So that, that's a very strong assumption. Uh, but, you know, you might want to consider the case also where sometimes the messages will reach uh, certain nodes and sometimes they won't, which is a pretty realistic uh, situation. So what we've been doing in the past couple of years is uh, trying to deal with communication uncertainty. And I'll just tell you what the model is. Um, okay, yeah, this is what I just said a minute ago. The work on wireless network algorithms assumes a single communication graph G, which just says where messages must reach. But what we're doing instead, instead is using two graphs uh, say G and G prime, where G represents where the messages have to be delivered, and G prime uh, represents where they may be delivered. Okay, so now when you introduce this uncertainty where some messages may or may not be delivered, um, many results change. Uh, in this setting, it turns out to be really um, a big complication to have these uh, unknown uh, edges thrown in because you have to worry about the collisions. That these unknown edges, these, these edges that might appear or might not, um, actually can introduce new collisions. So, for instance, the decay algorithm doesn't work anymore. There's no sweet spot for a receiver because there's an adversary who controls which messages actually reach everybody. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip this. These are just uh, bounds that we got for this model. Uh, we worked on a bunch of uh, different problems, uh, communication problems, and constructing graphs, uh, graph structures. And we get, have upper and lower bounds in the dual graph model. Uh, the high level bit here is that uh, there's more lower bounds than we would like to see. So this suggests that the dual graph model may be too pessimistic. Um, we assume basically an adversary can control 
uh, where the messages reach in the larger graph. But uh, lately we've been thinking about whether you can weaken the adversary so the model is still realistic, but it admits some more efficient algorithms. But these are still open questions. OK. Um, so the summary is just these six problems that uh, we looked at. And um, the fact that we're still uh, working on trying to get a complete theory for dynamic distributed systems. We have a lot of pieces for it. Uh, some of the future directions that we're interested in are uh, looking at different kinds of physical platform models. We've tended to assume uh, two, the coding-based model and the one uh, with message collisions. We really want to understand the impact of communication uncertainty. Of course, there's a lot more work to be done and many different kinds of algorithms. And we have to know how to compose these algorithms to get some overall algorithms uh, that make sense. Okay, more future directions, the math foundations. There's still work needed to pin down the right kinds of automata models underneath. They have to include time, discrete continuous behavior, probability. So that's a lot of stuff to be in one kind of a, a found concurrency foundation. And some things that we're looking at uh, this year are just how these wireless network algorithms connect with the biological algorithms. There's many types of biological systems, like insect colonies and um, organisms during development that behave quite a bit like uh, wireless networks. So it would be nice to understand the, the kinds of algorithms that are used in those systems. Uh, maybe we have something to teach the biologists. Maybe we'll learn new kinds of algorithms for uh, engineers. And that's it. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, You're all clapping, but I can't hear a thing. Good. Uh, we, have some, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, we can entertain a few. Let's see. If anybody text at AM or anybody would like to add a question. So if you have a question, make sure you unmute before you ask. And I believe anybody on who's watching us on YouTube, I believe if you type your question in the comments section, hopefully I can see it and I can share it with Nancy. Oh, yeah, that's good because I didn't, uh, I don't have yeah. that. No worries. <clears throat> no questions, anybody? It was so clear. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? OK. So Nancy, let me ask you a question. OK, so you are doing this uh, distributed environment, which is always a question how to understand the information in distributed environment, that you don't have everything in one place, yes. This information is distributed, uh, and, uh, uh, and time is involved, uh, involved in space. Uh, do you have any thought how to understand flow of information in distributed environment? A simple question, when you send one bit of information in network, when it arrives later, it should have less information, more useful information than when it is Trump, when it is basically in your place, when there is no delay. Is any thought on this? Um, Is there any thought on this? I'm not sure pre uh, precisely that question. I think the closest... Because this question is not precise, because we still want to ask the right question, but basically... Yeah. How information decay with time? So if I send, uh, let's say, info, you are sending information, I'm at location X. Yes, you do it all the time in mobile earthquake network. network. If the information for some reason, for example, disconnectivity, type topology, and so on, arrives very late, the information is completely uh, useless. Yes, mm -hmm. and actually not carry any information, might carry actual so there is a decay probably in capacity of the network because of that. Uh, and I can say a couple of things. Um, the closest work probably uh, we're doing to um, what you're talking about is probably work I'm talking about now with uh, Muriel Medard. Okay. A proposal to the Air Force. We're waiting to hear. Um, so it's basically looking at um, coding theory, coding for storage as well as coding for um, for communication, but the problem now is that we're imposing some use, some utility on the data. Mm -hmm. so 
basically, I'll think of the dynamic um, uh, atomic memory algorithms I started the talk with. Uh, suppose you want to uh, maintain atomic memory in, not, it doesn't have to be a dynamic network, any kind of a network, but you want to do this uh, with um, low communication, so you're trying to get the maximum capacity for performing the operations on the data. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, I'm, we're taking what Muriel's community usually does, the information theory people, and we're imposing a new constraint on them. Mm -hmm. We're saying it's not just a matter of making the, uh, you know, sending the data as quickly as possible. It's a matter of sending the right data and getting the right answers. So this, this optimization, it's a combination of distributed algorithms work and coding, but it's coding for storage and coding in the network. Uh, so, yeah, it's not just sending all the bits you can, but sending the bits to accomplish some higher level goal. Does that relate at all to what you're, you're describing? Actually, well, let me make a few comments. We have people like Sachi Weizmann and Tom uh, Kurte who are working on something that you mentioned at there. Information theory was mostly about recovering data. Okay, recover. Right now, it's more about answering gravity question. What do you do most of the time? You do search, and you want that your search actually answer the question. But yes. search, I would say, is more localized, less distributed. Uh, uh, I would, I would love to see actually uh, some work, and maybe what you do with Medard is actually this one. But I would like to see. Some, uh, some kind of a decay of information when the information that not arrive in a, 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 a so deadlines, that is one. Kumar is doing some work on this one. How topology, unravel topology, actually will have impact on scheduling when, when the nodes are much quicker can, you know. Well, it, can, it comes about with the, with the atomic memory because, uh, you know, there's no point in sending around unnecessary or older values of the, of the data. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you agree that at some point this will have a dramatic impact on the capacity. How much okay. useful, reliable information you can send when the topology is basically unreliable, and uh, and uh, the, the big delays may basically destroy the message. Okay, I think I asked enough questions. Yeah, no, but I think this is this is a direction that kind of came from the CSOI as well as from what things Muriel and I were thinking about. Uh, just instead of just having the goal be, you know, push as much data, as much information through the network as possible, start establishing some higher level criteria for what data. You, your, your condition is more capacity for the higher level operations you want to perform and not, not on the lower level uh, bits that, that you are, are pushing through. Sure. Yeah, so it's a combination of distributed algorithms work and coding work. Exactly, exactly, good. Yeah. The other Any other questions? Oh. Okay, looks like everybody is happy. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank I you. think it worked very well, actually, and we probably will continue in future having this virtual hangout. Thank you also to Barbara, who spent an enormous amount of time to arranging it. Uh, I think we did quite well today. Thank you very much to everybody. Yeah, I think this worked well. The students who did uh, other, I think they used Adobe Connect uh, before, and they um, they said it was very hard because they didn't couldn't get any feedback. I could see everybody, and that that helps because people nod yeah, yeah. whatever. But it might even be good to keep some keep the microphones on. I mean, I don't know if that would be too noisy. Yeah, I was just afraid it might be noisy. Something too noisy. Yeah, people were typing or something. I was just afraid it would be oh, noisy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people coming and going. Yeah, so right. good. But in a regular room, you know, if you're talking to a group of people, you hear those little incidental noises yeah. if they're not too loud, and sometimes that's useful. Okay. But yeah, I think this worked very well. It's the first time I've done this too. So uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, thank you for attending. Much appreciate. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.